Welcome back! So, World of Warcraft's next patch has been revealed, and honestly, it's kind of bigger than anyone thought. I mean, seriously, it is, and parts of it will ripple into the future, potentially in a big way. Now, we can expect to see this on the PTR either already by the time you're watching this video or within like a day or two. I personally expect to see this patch go live January 2024. Um, I mean, hell, even take a look at this roadmap. It, it basically looks like it's a little slice of the currently unrevealed 2024 roadmap for World of Warcraft. Now, of course, our headline features then. We've got worldwide dragon riding. We've got the Azerothian archives, whatever they may be, reclaiming Gilneas. Yes, it's happening. Follower dungeons, epilogues, new customers customizations, and a Love is in the Air update. So yeah, pretty cool, and because it's Love is in the Air, this will at least be live before February of next year. Unlike what's about to be live, today's sponsor. The LG 240Hz 1440p OLED monitor, and yes, that is the real set of specs. This is actually my first raid here I've been using this monitor on. And honestly, between the buttery smooth frame rate, the deep blacks, the amazing colors, it is just an absolutely fantastic experience. It's became my daily driver monitor being perfect for gaming and productivity, and you can learn more if you check out that link down below. Follower Dungeons, we got to talk about them. I think they could be a game changer for WoW. The first version of this is coming in this patch, and it lets you bring NPCs along with you to all eight Dragonflight normal mode dungeons. And the potential here is just crazy. So dungeons, right? They're often major parts of a zone narrative, but so many people just skip them. Maybe they're a DPS and they couldn't be bothered for the queue. Whatever it may be, they just skip. Whereas here, you can pick up your dungeon quests, go into the dungeon, and just do it. Yes, everyone will be able to solo a dungeon with a bunch of NPCs. Now, somebody who wants to say enjoy the story and not be rushed by a bunch of people who want to power level, they will be very happy with this. Blizzard, I think, will therefore feel a bit more confident, a bit more comfortable in just having dungeons be part of the main story. And guess what game already does this? Final Fantasy XIV with the duty support system. And for that game, it's really came in clutch in recent times because dungeons are a mandatory part of the MSQ. Now, this thing is, of course, only the beginning. Imagine a future where this could, say, scale up. I also wonder, like, the technology that actually makes this tick. I mean, how, how, how could that be used in the future? If Blizzard wanted to do essentially big solo boss fights where it's you and a bunch of NPCs, could they actually do something like that as a part of a narrative, maybe to have us actually fight a main villain of an expansion alongside Andua and Ilaria, any of those characters. That could actually make for a really cool set piece moment, the sort of set piece moment that Blizzard haven't really been able to do in a way that has felt that authentic. Kind of interesting. Basically, I just see the potential here to massively upgrade the narrative cohesion and actually the gameplay cohesion of WoW here. This could be really strong. And the other part of this that's killer is this means that players can actually learn mechanics in a natural environment. I'd like it if this could even go up to heroic mode just again so newer players could actually learn. Performance anxiety is absolutely a big problem in group content. The community is not always uh, embracing to players who don't exactly know quite what they're doing yet. Features like this then could really be a big part of that solution. Now, will I use this much outside of leveling and not wanting to do a dungeon queue? Honestly, probably not, but I think it's a really good, healthy feature for the game, and if they're able to do this, I then get excited about what other things they could potentially do, and also it is yet more evidence of Blizzard building the evergreen future of World of Warcraft, where these are just features that will stand to the game for ages. Also, come on, warbands. Everyone's kind of thinking the obvious thing here. If you could do a dungeon with a bunch of your uh, characters, that would be fairly interesting. I don't know. I mean, progression-wise, that could be a nightmare if they really wanted to go whole hog into it. But uh, anyway, it's something they could do. Let's talk about Gilneas, which they are doing. So the Emil Drasil ending had people over on Twitter wondering what's going to happen to the Worgen next. And uh, yeah, they didn't have to wonder for too long, because now we know. King Greymane is ready to retake his kingdom, but Gilneas is not as empty as he expected, according to their blog post. Who's there? What's going on? Blizzard have been quite inconsistent with Gilneas for years. Uh, to just put some of the pieces together, though, before the Shadowlands epilogue, it seems there may have been some Bloodfang pack members, maybe some Forsaken around there, with much of it obviously just being ruined and abandoned. But in the Shadowlands epilogue, Kalia Menethil sends a letter to Gen saying that she's going to withdraw the Forsaken forces from Gilneas. So essentially, it seems that uh, no, like, 
big power block, right? Big geopolitical body has got a foothold there. And as for the regions around it, well, near it, you've got Tolbarad, which is held by the Alliance. Then, according to Exploring Azeroth Eastern Kingdoms, the Alliance has reclaimed South Shore, which does suggest a decent foothold in that region, though the book does note that uh, there are still plenty of worgen and undead going around the zone, right? Uh, Arathi, then. Arathi is in Alliance hands firmly. Um, then, of course, up to the north, Silver Pine Forest appears to now be in fairly firm, forsaken control following their heritage questline where they fended off that incursion from the Scarlets. And all that means is we've got a total power vacuum here, and those are always great for narrative potential and real-life horror, but let's not talk about that. Threats, then. I think renegade human threats could actually be a thing here. Of course, you've got the Scarlet Brotherhood propaganda. You've got the recent resurgence of the Scarlets, who were not fully defeated in that Forsaken quest because A, they were portaling fresh troops like reinforcements in from somewhere, and B, there's a large group of Crusaders that are confirmed as of exploring Azeroth Northrend to be in that big Crusader harbor at Northrend. So uh, yeah, they could be there. Could be bandits, could be rebels, could be something tied to the Blackwald, which is the location where Hearthstone's witch Witchwood expansion was set. Mostly, though, I'm just happy that they're not letting an old story lie about the place. And that is where there's really true potential. With these minor patches, of which we're getting three by the time this expansion ends, Blizzard have just got so much, uh, you know, so much of an option to just do cool things. I'll talk about it more in tomorrow's video, but you see as of 10-2, like the ending that we've seen now, this expansion's like story outside of tier is basically done, wrapped up in a neat enough bow. And that kind of means we just have a few patches for, um, I guess, prologue to the next expansion and then to flesh out the world. Obviously then, I think of the Night Elves. I mean, come on, I think you guys, you elves, you may have a few settlements you could clean up back in your home regions in and around Kalimdor, right? It'd be nice to see Ashenvale be somewhere that uh, they can go again. And obviously, it's not like the Modern Horde would see that as a threat, especially since the Modern Horde very much knows that they, um, you know, kind of did the whole fourth war and made, uh, made made that tree go crispy. Anyway, my point here is that Blizzard are clearly willing to actually take a look at the world and to treat parts of it right, even when there is not a humongous connection to current expansion content. And what that is, is developing the world of Warcraft, not just the expansion of Warcraft. And in some ways, this X-Pack, that's been a bit of a strength. I mean, sure, the Night Elf Heritage Quest was quite the L. However, just about everything else was fantastic. And hey, after the Worgen Heritage Quest that I think most people even forgot happened, yeah, I think the Worgens kind of deserve this. What else then? Well, obviously, worldwide dragon riding, though not dynamic flight. Full dynamic flight will be a thing in the next expansion, and that is totally reasonable. That's because there's a mammoth amount of work from the devs to update animations for every mount in the game, especially ones that don't have wings. Uh, so, for me then, that they're willing to ship basically what they can now and get it into players' hands, that's terrific. I, uh, yeah, I like their style. Azerothian Archives. This is the new public event in the Azure Span, where we seemingly meet a cast of unique characters, witness iconography uh, from a time before, and we do solo and group activities within a weekly public event um, with the opportunity to explore and earn battle pets, mounts, and a mog set. So, some sort of new big public event. Don't really think we saw that coming. In my head, I suppose I'm expecting time rifts, but perhaps with slices of Azeroth's history around. It's hard to say exactly, but I think events like this are actually really welcome. I mean, as an example, take time rifts. I mean, I'm primarily a raider, you know, sort of casual raider, um, but I'm primarily a raider. But even the time rifts that they did in uh, 1015, those kept me going a decent few times a week for a month. And that sure is time where otherwise, having already done Avarice, I wouldn't really have been playing the game. So they're totally welcome by me. Then some customizations, we've got five new hair colors coming in for the trolls, as well as customizations for the Draenei, for the Warlock, Tyrant, and Dark Glare, plus some customization achievements being thrown in too. And then of course the epilogues, right? Just epilogues, which are continuing the Dragonflight story, but just kind of wrapping things up for the various, I suppose, peoples we've seen around the place, which I think is very good. Because all too often, you know, the, the main story happens and then it stops. I mean, imagine, even take the uh, the Tuscar and Wrath of the Lich King, or the Tonka. Imagine if we got an epilogue quest with them after the Lich King fell. Would that not have been really good? And it would have almost made uh, those aspects, those peoples in the game's lore and history, kind of rest easy, instead of us feeling like, you know, there's unfinished business and we're not really done with them, right? So I really do appreciate that as well. Now. That is just the headline features that will likely be more under the hood. As an example, you already know the Drakthir are getting full dynamic flight via Soar. 
You might be wondering then, what will the future hold and when will it come? Well, what appeared to be Brawler's Guild assets popped up in 1017's PTR cycle, which seems a bit sus to me. And then, a while back in interviews, right, they basically said that if the Brawler's Guild was to return, it would come back in an evergreen fashion. Uh, to me, that would be uh, really awesome. And as much as I think the social element of it is really cool, maybe have that be like a special event thing, but the main Brawler's Guild be instant so you can just kind of like go and do it like the Mage Tower. I don't know. Anyway, I think it would be pretty sweet. And I'd also imagine that, uh, you know, now that the team is so much bigger, they would actually be able to give the Brawler's Guild like rewards that are actually, you know, cool. Anyway, the other thing that we definitely know is coming is a final season to this expansion. It'll be a fated season, I don't know what they'll call it, but it'll be basically like season four of Shadowlands, which uh, overall is a good thing, but it will, I hope, be better. And that is because whenever they were talking about how well they thought season four of Shadowlands went, they actually said to us that um, if they were to do it again, they would really want to be able to have more of it be relevant to world content players. So it seems fairly obvious they'll work in that type of thing. They've also, by the way, mused on uh, outdoor time walking before. But again, nothing super solid there. As for schedules then, look, man, the WoW train is, uh, it's blasting, it seems. So expect this patch. Uh, I'm just going to say the second Tuesday of January. Uh, so imagine that. And then 10.2.7 probably two months later, in March, 10.2.9, maybe in April or May, along with season four, and then perhaps an expansion launch in October or November with a pre-patch just before. That would essentially be holding up a patch every eight weeks, and compared to literally any time in World of Warcraft's past, that is an insanely superior content cadence that absolutely represents a far better value for the vast majority of players. Yes, I know if you purely count in terms of raid tiers, there are three raid tiers in this expansion. I would say though that yes, raids are one type of content. For a lot of other players, there's other types of content that do matter, and we've got a hell of a lot more of that than we have had in past expansions. So I suppose for me, I'm just left thinking that I want whatever strange narrative funk or weird phase that they're in right now, I kind of want that to be over because, and it's not that the narrative is bad, it's just that it's so all over the place. You get some of these really like beautiful, touching, well executed, well voice acted, even well written moments, uh, just interspersed with the absolute goofery of the final, uh, you know, the, the, the Farak cinematic. I mean, obviously it didn't have Farak in it, but you know what I mean. Um, I just want that roller coaster to be over because for real, the game, aside from that, is it is stronger than ever. It is firing in all cylinders, raring to go. I mean, when I first started making content, very soon I ran into Siege of Orgrimmar, which lasted for 14 months. And it was a hard 14, like beyond a few uh, XP and legendary quest catch-up events, that was it. So man, yeah, we're, uh, we're eating so much better now. It's kind of crazy. This has definitely whet my appetite. They said there will be a few surprises uh, coming in the, um, you know, in the continued support for Dragonflight. I imagine we've got one or two of them here. I wonder if there will be any surprises for the future patches. Okay, let me know uh, what you think. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, and of course, you can check out this video over here if you want some more WoW-related entertainment, and I'll see you over there.